Hey, everybody. Welcome to our weekly podcast where we discuss all things game audio from creative ideas, the latest techniques and project experiences to audio secrets. Here's where you'll find your in-depth coverage and opinions related to game audio. And I'd like to say hi to our panelists before introducing our awesome special guest. But let's start with Vince. How you doing, Vince? Hello, oh, man. I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing my best to not labor today's Labor Day here in America, and uh, so far I've been pretty successful. <laughs> well done. Is that your new apartment we're seeing? Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, I was thinking about doing it in the office today, but it didn't seem right considering the holiday, so here I am at Shea Vince's. I like the beams. Is it a house or apartment? Uh, it's kind of a, a small house that was built behind another house in this light residential area just outside of Los Angeles. It's uh, pretty nice. I don't mind it. It looks nice from the angle I'm getting. Uh, yeah, congrats. I'll show you guys around sometime. It's, uh, it's uh, pretty great. Maybe I'll try hosting some functions over here. It's a nice space. Oh, that's awesome. Can't wait. Well, congratulations. And Thank we'll you. go over to Mike, who's probably not too far from you. Right, Mike? I don't think so, no. Uh, I'm doing well. My air conditioner is broken. So uh, if I collapse in the middle of the show, it's probably heat stroke. <laughs> Keep talking. I have to shut a window because somebody got, somebody just started drilling outside. So you're gonna in, in solidarity with me, you're gonna increase the temperature of your own room. I appreciate that. Nope, I'm gonna cool it down. Actually, I've got the air conditioner going. Sorry, Mike. Can't help you there. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mike's mad at me. No, I just lost audio for 10 seconds, so that's just what happened. <laughs> that's what you say every time I talk. You go, hey, Kyle, I lost the audio for there for a second while you were talking. I'm going to let that go. So, uh, hey, Alex, how, how's things in Japan? Uh, good, thanks. Finally cooling down. We uh, The humidity is dropping from its usual 7 billion percent to uh, something more manageable, like maybe 100%. Um, uh, doing well. Working hard at... Uh, Vitae and Winning Blimp uh, up to my up to my armpits in wires at the moment. So um, I have a I'm seeing all gray. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's such a great color palette in that in that application, huh? Yeah, they, they don't uh, they don't mess around, do they? It's like no. uh, you're you're here to work. You're not here to like admire our beautiful colorful interface. You're going to work. <laughs> oh yeah, but I, it it. So, and, and uh, to find a positive about it, it does help me focus. I don't, I don't get distracted by anything. Or yeah, I mean, every, everything else about Wise is uh, is incredible, except the gray. I mean, yeah, gray. I don't know. Anyway, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. But let's get to Karen Collins, who's joining us from uh, Toronto area. Hi, Karen. Oh, I think we lost you. You might be muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yep. Is that better? <laughs> no, that's very good. There's the audio person forgetting to unmute their mic. Yeah. Uh, okay. How are you doing? We deal with it all the time. Doing great. Thanks for being on the show. Karen Collin from the, uh, from the uh, Kickstarter for Beep, uh, the history of game sound. We wanted to have you on and talk about how the Kickstarter is going, but also to learn about your history of uh, what got you into audio and and to take it so seriously through uh, through your uh, professional career, you know, you don't meet as many PhDs of uh, audio as as I'd like, you know, it's wonderful. And uh, just to see what got you started musically, and then what took you into game, and then talk about the Kickstarter and how things are going. Um, but first of all, how's the weather in Canada? <laughs> well, you might hear some thunder throughout the, the, the podcast. That would be me. We're we're having a big storm. Uh, it's been hot and humid the past few days. It's been really miserable, so I can sympathize um, with anybody in Japan where it would be much, much worse. But uh, for us, this is kind of, yeah, this is par for the course. It's summer. I miss it myself because here, uh, I think Mike and Vince will all say, I'm north of them. I'm not in L.A. proper. I'm in the next county up. And thunderstorms are very rare here. And I miss the giant thunder claps and lightning strikes. But uh, it's not all that fun. Water and precipitation. Any sort of precipitation. If you can give it to us, please do. We need yeah. it. We do need it's it. The, you know, it's the computer crashing when you're in the middle of something that, that is the worst part of a thunderstorm. But, yeah, if you can unplug and hang out and enjoy it, it's great. Oh, mm -hmm. I have to tell a quick story but just because I love it. When I was uh, Before the show, we were talking about how uh, I spent my youth years in Canada 
from zero to eighteen and, and then beyond that. But um we were up at our cabin in, at Lake West Lamcoon and uh, a lightning storm woke me up and it's so dark up there guys you can't see your hand in front of your face at night. You just literally it is so dark. And uh and the this lightning we had this storm and the lightning woke me up and, and we used to share beds because it was a small cabin. So I had my little tiny nephew there and um and the lightning struck struck and it woke me up and then it struck again and I thought I better look over and see if he's okay and but I couldn't see him because again it's so dark you can't see and then lightning hit a third time right when I was looking at him his face was right in mine and he was just scared to death <laughs> I about fell out of the darn bed oh I'll never forget that but we went out to the front room to the main room of the cabin we had this big picture window and uh, we're right on the water and uh, and Every, my whole family was out there. Everybody was already... I was like the last person to wake up from this thing. I thought I was the first. It was kind of funny when you walk out there and they're all so quiet. But we watched the lightning uh, from the front room and one struck so close to the cabin that you could smell the... Uh, what's that? The ozone that comes off of the, the lightning strike. It's an amazing storm to experience anyway. So I, I wanted to share that. Enough about me. So, Karen, tell me how you got started in all of the in, in the, your history with audio and how you it brought you over to game audio. Well, um, I've been obsessed with sound my whole life with music. Um, when I was six, I guess I was an early starter. I had a crush on Elvis, and um, <laughs> so <laughs> I wanted to learn guitar so I could be like Elvis because. Awesome. The young Elvis, not the fat Vegas Elvis. You know. I'm not talking about uh, Is this Costello or Presley? Yeah. Oh, Presley! Come oh, on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Give me some credit. <laughs> Has there ever been a young, skinny Costello? I don't. I'm not... <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So I started playing uh, guitar, and then in school, I learned uh, a little bit of piano, a little bit of violin. Um, and just was completely obsessed with, with music my whole life. Um, but at the time I was going back to, to school, to university, there was nowhere that where I could really sort of study the kind of music I wanted to study, um, which was not classical, European classical music. And so um, I studied art instead, and I just sort of thought, well, art is something that I can do with my hands while I listen to music. <laughs> so I kind of kind of abandoned music, I guess, for a little while. Um, and then I went back and did my PhD in music after I discovered um, that it, it was possible to study more popular forms of music. So I studied uh, industrial music, oh, which wow. you, you, you're probably aware has a lot of non-musical sounds, which I think is what always drew me to industrial music. And, and I looked at sort of how that related to film music. There's a lot of sort of dystopian science fiction film music that uses the same kinds of sounds and sort of ties it all together. So I did a lot of studying of science fiction cinema um, for my PhD and, and writing about non-musical sound and I spent four years just going around kind of banging on stuff with you know pieces of wood or pieces of metal banging on other pieces of metal. You know, how does that, is that the right sound? Is this the right sound? You know, how does that change the sound? And just playing with sound for, for years, I drove everybody around me absolutely crazy. Hmm. Um, and then sort of partway through my PhD, I kind of went, oh, I wonder why there's all this sort of Phrygian mode in, in music these days. Like a lot of the industrial stuff that uses Phrygian, a lot of heavy metal from the 80s used Phrygian mode. I'm like, well, you know, it's, where are all these minor seconds coming from? And then I was playing this old Atari game and I was like, oh my god, it's full of these minor seconds, you know. And I started to put the two and two together, like, wow, you know, maybe maybe my whole um, musical palette, maybe my tastes were driven by my playing these games from a very young age. And, you know, because I spent hours and hours sitting in front of this, this Atari 2600, which is totally out of tune. It makes these absolutely crazy, wacky sounds um, that I... I totally loved and I still love. So I think that for me, like the games completely changed who I who I am and the kinds of sounds I like, the kinds of music I listen to. And so I, I just thought, you know, I've got to finish my PhD so I can study game music instead. Um, and that was kind of a big motivator for me to actually get my PhD done was so I could put industrial music aside and, and start listening to game music all the time instead. Um, so that's kind of the story, how I got from there to here. Wow, that's fascinating. Now, are colleges now offering game audio courses? Or are you kind of uh, 
shepherding that into the education system there? You know, there, there are some courses uh, available at some schools. My school doesn't. Um, a lot of universities have been slow to pick up on game music, and there's been a lot of resistance. It, it's weird. Musicology departments are really kind of um, conservative and traditional and really resist change. So suggesting something like, we, let's have a game music course, you know, it, it's just, yeah, it's going to take a while for them to get there. But there are, there are more independent colleges that teach game sound, and, and particularly vocational colleges where you can go and study, you know, do a course and, and get all the skills you need to do, you know, learn FMOT, learn WISE, learn all the sound design skills or, or music composition skills that you need to know. Places like Berkeley and Boston as mm -hmm. well, um, for sure. And I've been part of an initiative with the IASIG, that's the Interactive Audio Special Interest Group. And we spent years putting together a list of all the skills that anybody working in game audio should have. It's in a document. It's free online on their website. Uh, I'll type in the, the link on the uh, yeah. iasig.org and just look around in there for the game audio curriculum guidelines. And we worked with a lot of people in the industry who said, you know, you should have these skills or these are... Uh, the kinds of things that we would like to see being taught to these these kids. So we've put it all together. That's great, Vincent. Um, got the yeah. full link there. So yeah, I mean, and now it's it's a couple of years old, but it still I think holds up um, as far as the kinds of skills that people need to know. So we've been kind of working on trying to make it easier for colleges and universities to institute a kind of course like that, mm -hmm. um, because. A lot of people that are working in the institutions don't have a background in game audio and they don't know how to teach this stuff. So we've been trying to provide all the material that they would need to know in order to be able to teach it. What do you think is the um, uh, the reason for the reluctance to accept game audio as a serious academic facet for study? Why do you think people don't take it seriously? Um, it tends to be a, an old white male crowd that is in these uh, these institutions that, that teach at the university level. And a lot of them come from a, a traditional classical music um, background as far as their own education. And they haven't been exposed to game music. I mean, th this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do a documentary is just to say, you know what, stop calling this stuff not art because <laughs> it is. And you need to sit down and listen to this. And um, so a lot of it is just, you know, when I, even now when I tell people, you know, I, I study game music, they say, what, like Pac-Man? You know, like, come on, was that the last game you played, like, 40 years ago, you know? No, not like Pac-Man, you know? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I, I think that if people get exposed to this, and, and it's changing a little bit, there, there's a few courses being offered. I think as game music has moved into more sort of orchestral and this, these sort of epic scores that that sound more like film music, that it's becoming a lot more accepted. Um, I'm not sure if that's a good thing because I think there's an awful lot of interesting things to say about the older music before it became all orchestral as well. Mm, uh, and my concern is that that stuff would get ignored in favor of, oh, look, you know, here's the orchestral stuff that sounds like the other music that we talk about in class or whatever. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I, I really uh, applaud you there because um, I grew up with the Commodore Amiga and um, all of the classic, uh, it wasn't so much game audio, but was the demo scene audio yeah. uh, is what I grew up with. And, of course, that bled, bled into um, game music on the Amiga as well because it's all using the same technology. Um, and, uh, yeah... It's it's funny though that because all of, a lot of game audio people come from a classical, classical educated background anyway, but I guess maybe I don't know what it is. Maybe in the generation that we are, the standard form of entertainment for a young kid is just to play video games, and maybe um, that that's what kind of brings it together. But as you say, it's fantastic what you're doing to bring some awareness to the technological achievements of some of those early early exploits, like for example on the Amiga and the Commodore 64 and earlier. Um, but also the the artistic achievements there as well, because there's some great music. Yeah, absolutely. And just because it's made on a chip doesn't mean that it's not worth listening to, you know. Um, and uh, some of this stuff is getting out there, because you have game music orchestras now that are playing some of those older tunes on an orchestra, and then people are realizing that, oh, yeah, actually, you know, that was a really great song. Um, mm. So it's getting there, but it's it's slow. Yeah, our last couple of episodes we've discussed a lot about what kind of gets a song to stick in your head and how we can 
I guess not directly if we said it this way, but indirectly, how we can get that to be, uh, um, you know, how you can create a memorable song in a game that you're going to whistle, like you know, like some Led Zeppelin song or something from your youth. And it's fascinating to try to think of the psychology of how to get that going. So I'm glad that you're you're teaching people about what's available in game audio and how there's so many so many great pieces of music being written in game audio. But in addition to that, being a, a sound designer, which is what I do a lot of. Um, do you find that, um, I love asking this question, do you find, which do you find more creative, composition or, or um, sound design? I, I don't think you can really compare the two um, in the sense that you, you can't put one above the other. Um, you know, me coming from more of a music background, I actually do sound design work myself. Um, and I find that for me that's enough. Like I'm getting my creative muse activated by just doing sound design. I think there's enough there that if you're really into sound, then you can be as you know creative as the greatest composers ever. Um, I don't really, I guess, make such a distinction between music and sound because the greatest scores have sound effects in them. The greatest sound design works on a musical level. It works on a rhythmical level. It, it's mm. kind of like a score. It's just done with sound effects. Um, and maybe it's it's not a score in the traditional sense, but it's still putting sounds together in, in a way that makes sense and makes the scene uh, emotionally impactful and so on. So, yeah, I don't think you can do an either or on that one. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, too. That's a very good point. I um. I agree. You know, I come from a musical background as well, not obviously as uh, as esteemed as yours, but um, I find that with sound design, sometimes I feel like I'm being more creative because uh, most times I'm asked to just make a sound that doesn't exist rather than to try to sound like something that already exists, which is what happens when I'm composing something. And that right. always, I always kind of think, how can we mix those together? Because it's just, and the reason I bring it up is because just just yesterday we were up in Santa Barbara at a friend's house and we were listening to a bunch of a bunch of music that we. He built a home studio, and uh, we were in there and just listening to all kinds of crazy stuff. And he brought out some hip-hop band I'd never, ever heard of that had only a little bit of rap. Musically, it was you couldn't distinguish it from any kind of genre. And, um, and there was so much sound design in the actual composition that it was almost a 50-50 split. You know, there would, there would be music happening, but then they had all these things happening, like street noises, or they had... We, they were doing weird things with strings, like bending orchestras, you know, at, like they were on a keyboard. And and I was going, man, I wish we could do that in games. I wish that we could present uh, a score and go, here is what we what we envision for your game. And they go, oh my god, this is amazing. And unfortunately, a lot of the times I, I end up uh, when I when any time that I would introduce something that is kind of an amalgamation of those two together, amalgam, amalgam. I make up words all the time. Um, Michael, correct me. <laughs> Thank God. Um, that they, the producer will often separate them and say, the sound design aspects of this will be handled. Pull that out and just give me pure music. And I think, oh, but those go so hand in hand sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking well, of uh, the movie Tetsuo. You know, do you know that movie? Chu I, Ishikawa did this. Oh, you, you have to go watch this movie. It was a crazy. It's called Tetsuo mm -hmm. the Iron Man. It was this crazy Japanese movie, and it's just full of this kind of industrial soundtrack where it is all of that sound design and music thrown together. It's just, yeah, you, you have to watch that. I will check that out for sure. So tell us about the Kickstarter. Well, the Kickstarter um, is to make a documentary film that would be a history of video game music and sound design together. I'm not separating the two for this either. So awesome. we have lots of sound designers, and we have composers, and we have voiceover actors. We've got um, you know chip makers, all kinds of people lined up, middleware people. Um, we're just going to bring them all together, and we're going to interview... Oh, we have about 60 people actually lined up right now. Oh, wow. And it might grow. <laughs> and we uh -huh. realized that we can't put all of this into a documentary film because everybody would get 30 seconds and it would just be a big mess. But what we want to do is put all of the interviews online and people can watch the whole thing. Um, so we would put the, kind of the highlights in this documentary film, but then all of this material, you know, in its sort of true sense of a documentary, we're going to document this history, <clears throat> get these people to tell their stories 
um, and hopefully also give us any documents they have that we can archive for them and make available to people online. Like one of the guys I talked to, I won't say his name because I'm not sure that this this is something he made public, but he made uh, the sound chip for one of the the consoles, and he got in touch with me and he said, you know, um, I have these these documents as well, and I said, oh, that's great. You know, we can come, we can archive the stuff, we'll digitize it for you. You know, anything you've got, if you've got boxes of stuff in your basement that you thought someday I got to do something with that, we'll come and archive it. And he said, you know what? I just moved last month and I threw it all out. Oh. Uh, yeah, I know. So you know, we're trying to stop that and, oh. and get this stuff documented now before you know before this happens to all of these guys and they get fed up lugging this stuff around every time they move. So you know, I, I think the time is right to, to go out there and, and, and document this stuff for the future because people are going to be interested in, in what we're doing today but also you know, what's happened in the last 30 years as far as video game sound. Wow. You know, I was looking through the names on the website, which, by the way, uh, Kickstarter projects, or kickstarter.com slash projects slash vmix, V-E-E-M-I-X slash beep a documentary history of video game sound with a hyphen between all of those words. Um, I was looking at the interviews and I saw a bunch of people up here I've never heard of, like George Sanger. Who's ever heard of him? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know, Winifred, uh, geez, I haven't heard of any of these people. Tommy, no, it's a beautiful list of interviews. I can't wait to see this. You know, somebody I've always wanted to talk to is Emily Ridgeway. Yeah, you know, I, if, I mean, for me, being being a woman, it was really important to me that we have uh, some diversity of voices of people that we're interviewing. Um, and, and as well, there's all kinds of female Japanese composers that we just don't hear about. Um, but somebody like Emily Ridgeway, I mean, you know, she did the music for Bioshock. People yeah. should know her name. Everybody played this game. Everybody loved this game. It, you know, it's time that these people got some recognition for the work that they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great one, too. Well, there's so many good ones there. I can't even pick. Alexander Branding, Clint Bajakian, just such luminaries in the, in the industry. It's wonderful. And the fact that you're collecting all this digital information as well, and, or this information and digitizing it so it's preserved for the future, is extremely important. Absolutely. You know, good job. You guys got anything you want to say before I just slather in more compliments? <laughs> keep going, keep going. <laughs> I was kind of curious about the the format for the documentary. Uh, Karen, is it going to be a feature film, or is it an episodic series that you might hope to see on television? What's what's the actual medium? Well, our plan right now is a feature film length. Um, but looking at how many people are coming on board, it might end up being a feature film followed by a, you know a kind of mini series or something, um, because there's just so many people, and I know that they have so much to say. I mean. You know, do, doing a kind of pre-interview with some of these people and talking about, you know, I'm kind of would like you to talk about this, and then they just go on for an hour, and you just think, you know, I, I've got to capture this stuff and share this because this is so important. Um, so, uh, yeah, our, our plan is is for feature length, you know, sort of 90 minutes, and that's what we've lined up our post-production team to be doing. So we we can't really tell them, well, no, we, now you've got to make a three-hour documentary. <laughs> Um, so we'll do the 90 minutes and then we might, you know, sort of see where we're at as far as all of the content that, that we've gathered and, and maybe make, you know, do some more highlight reels, sort of, sort of speak of, of episodes of this stuff. Oh, wow. Just like you, can always just, you can always just uh, make 90 minutes of Amiga music. <laughs> 90 Sorry. minutes of what? Amiga music. <laughs> Amiga music. You know, I've got a great Amiga story for you. Yeah, so when I lived in Ottawa, this was about 10 years ago, and um, I, I, this is like Craigslist was kind of just taking off, and I was looking on Craigslist just, you know, at that time I was, I was already researching game sound, and I was always on the lookout for old video game machines, so I saw this ad, it was like, free Commodore 64s and Amigas, you have to pick them up today, and I I was like, okay, you know, I didn't have a car, but I belonged to this car share, so I got this um, this Toyota Echo, you know, which is a small car. It, it, I think they call it the Yaris now, but it, at that time it was the Echo. So I got this Echo, and I drove to this guy's house. Well, this guy had collected these things from some high school that had just kind of chucked them out, you know, ten years before, 
And there was like 40 of these things. So the entire echo, floor to ceiling, you know, back to front, was absolutely chock full of these Amigas and Commodore 64s. It was like the greatest day ever. <laughs> yeah, that would, uh, I think the guy selling that would be my brother. Actually, uh, he has uh, <laughs> not 40. He has uh, six. Like, yeah, I think uh, that's he's not a school. He's a he's a programmer. But I think. Um, Around the time, the late 90s, when they started to go, up, they started to become uh, an endangered species. He set it on himself to collect all of the poor, lonely amigas in in our town. So he's oh, he's got uh, all six of them. All right. oh, uh, <laughs> all town. It's so um I don't know because uh, from my upbringing, you know, I grew up in um in Australia, and of course, Australia was uh, very very Commodore focused, and we didn't really have we had the Mega Drive or the, the Sega Genesis, but Nobody really had them. Everybody had Commodore Amigas. And so in Game Audio now, like when I go to events like GDC and, and meet other Game Audio people, you know, I want to talk about all this classic Amiga music, but nobody knows about any of it. It's like, Amiga? What? What's that? Is that, isn't, is, is that Mexican? It's like, no, no. It's, it's like it's a proud Californian computer that you should know about. But, you know, and there's all this, uh, and there's the whole legacy of, you know, tracker music and uh, um, uh, all of the... Yeah, I won't go on because I've gone forever. But the guys know that I just tend to ramble it when, as soon as we say Tracker or Amiga, <laughs> I just won't stop. <laughs> we, did you see we're, we're interviewing Alistair Brimble, who who's did really? you know, wow. over 100 Amiga titles. Yeah, you, yeah, should, um, so. you should see if you can get Chris Hills back as well. The, we have uh, Chris Hills back as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. We're really going after these guys, yeah. Beautiful. As a matter of fact, in the yeah. list of interviews on the website, you've got Alistair Bramble and then you've got Chris Hillsbeck right, be right below. I mean, they're next to each other. Brilliant. Wow. Names yeah, I've never heard of. It's so wonderful to, to, you know, to meet people who are excited about the stuff that people have done and to introduce, like an old guy like me, I'm, I'm hearing names I've never even heard of. I can't wait to well, see. Well, a lot of times in these old games, they just didn't have the, the guy's name attached to it. Yeah. So you'd play the game, but you never knew who made the music or who made the sound. So yeah. uh, it's uh, it's a shame because when you think about how many hours you spent listening to this music and you know the the theme song, but you don't know the person that wrote that music, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I, as a matter of fact, we were talking about this on a previous show. There's, a, We were talking about like composers who we really love, and I, I had to look up a guy who wrote some early uh, Sega Genesis stuff that I really loved. And to this day, I can just start hearing in my head. I don't have to hear notes or play the game or see a screenshot. I can just hear it because I loved it so much. And then when I told the guys their names, like, the, the name, these guys were like, oh, yeah, he, he's done this and that and that other thing. <laughs> as far as I knew, he did that one game, and I never heard of him again. <laughs> oh, sometimes I'm so uneducated, you know. You get busy, you get your head down, but... It's great to, to have people around who can introduce me to people that, that I've heard and didn't know the name, so thank you. Um, it'd, be, it'd, be, um, it'd be good if you could get uh, Austin Wintery as well. Uh, I don't see him on your list here because he's a wonderful ambassador for... because um, he wrote the soundtrack to Journey, of course, and many other great titles, and that won the... Was it a Grammy nomination? Or was it actually a Grammy or something, was it? A Grammy nomination, yeah. Yeah. He yeah. And he's a wonderful ambassador of uh, of you know the potential for game music in the in the modern day. You know the sort of creeping into the general public awareness of of wow that that music came from a game. Yeah. Yes, it came from a game. <laughs> you know, you know. Strangely, Alex, I thought you were Austin Wintry just going under a nom de plume. Yeah, we um, Karen, we uh, we <laughs> look quite similar. Actually, we met at GDC this year. He somebody one of my friends mistook him for me. So hey, Alex. And then Austin said, "Sorry, what?" <laughs> and uh, so he, he hunted me down on Twitter, and we met at GDC, and we have a, a picture, and we, we do actually look very similar. That explains my intense musical genius. Well, actually, no, he's got all the musical genius, and I, I didn't get left any of it. You got all the good looks, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Well, can you can you fake an American accent, and we'll just call you call you Austin? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Karen, in selecting your lineup of uh, future interviewees, I guess these are people who have committed to being in the documentary yeah. once you move forward, did you try to emphasize any part of game audio history, or did you aim for an even spread across the different eras and the different uh, time periods? 
Yeah, we've aimed for for a broad spread because that's what we want to cover. We you know we want to go back to the the arcade machines to the old um, Atari years up through the you know the eight bit, sixteen bit, so right through up to today. So yeah, we've tried to hit every sort of era with at least uh, two or three people. And who is I don't want to say oldest, um, but who goes furthest back uh, in game audio history of your perspective interviewees? Ah, oh, that's interesting. Um, maybe Brad Fuller? He did old Atari like uh, arcade console games. Um, David Thiel's been around forever as well. Mm. Um, so both these guys go back to like 1980 or so. Uh, is there anybody that goes back farther than that? I think that's probably as far as we go. How awesome to have David feel because the Qbert voice is so iconic. Yeah, you know, I, I posted this thing on uh, on uh, Facebook, and, and I belong to a bunch of game audio groups on Facebook, and I guess he heard about it through there, and he contacted me, and he's like, well, I've done a bunch of pinball games. I'm like, dude, you're the voice of Qbert. Like, come on. Like, I don't care about pinball. You know, <laughs> Qbert. <laughs> Was that a recorded voice, or was that synthesized from from scratch? You'll have to get the Kickstarter to find out. Yeah, but yeah, you want the full story, you've got to fund us. <laughs> no spoilers. Good point. <laughs> oh yeah, I was looking through the Kickstarter um, levels, and I love it. it's level one, level two, level three, level four, boss level. You know, that's that's, that's great creativity right there to associate that with the uh, levels of a game. Well, things kind of got a bit confusing for us because after we launched, it was very sort of straightforward. And then um, people came on board and said, you know, we'd really like it, it if you could give away our album as part of your campaign. And thought, okay, that's great. And then I discovered after saying that's great to a bunch of people that we couldn't actually add things into existing levels. So we had to make these sort of in-between levels where they're like Easter eggs and bonus rounds and all these like, oh my God, now it's kind of got really crazy as far as the levels. But... Um, we try to keep things really affordable as well. You know, when I looked at other Kickstarters and what they were asking for for films and stuff, and I, like twenty-five dollars for a digital film, like I can go to iTunes and get it for six bucks. Why am I going to give you twenty-five? So, you know, we really tried to keep all the prices down low as well. Yeah, it's well done. Absolutely, the spacing is really nice, and there's so much going on. There's so many things you can get at all the different levels. That's got to be difficult to do. I've never set up a Kickstarter, but I'm fascinated by how to set up all those levels and not like overlap or like in the early days Kickstarter would say like for level one you would get this, for level two you would get this new thing and that old thing and level three you'd get this new thing and the last two old things you know or previous things, old things not a proper word um, you know the, then I was talking to a friend of mine who did a Kickstarter campaign and he was going with a marketing firm doing it for them and they, they made sure that every level was something completely new um, what did you find? Uh, what's the formula you're using? Is it uh, similar to the first, to the, to the former I was mentioning? Or? We started out as having, yeah, every level would be built off the last, but then there were things that, you know, we just couldn't give away enough of to offer that kind of um, oh, yeah, you know, build up. So, I mean, there's, there's certain things that just take us more time because we've got to make them and so on. So we, we didn't... Um, we didn't build them all that way, but the first sort of five, six levels are, yeah, you get everything from the previous level and something else. That's that's really cool. I just noticed here also we're going to be covering part of the website. We're going to be covering interviews, complete histories, the psychology of game sound, which I'm just fascinated by, behind the scenes, chip tunes, current use, game sound technology, tools and techniques, bonus material. Wow. It's incredibly ambitious, Karen. I hope you can fit it all into <laughs> 90 minutes. Well, that's it. We won't be able to fit it into 90 minutes, so it re really is about the sort of extra content that we're going to be doing as well because, right. yeah, there's, there's no way to fit that into to 90 minutes. But we're also going to have everything in, in a book, so all of the mm. interviews and everything will be transcribed and, and written out in a book with explanations mm. of terms because we know, like, we're going to get really nerdy with these people. I mean, I've been researching this stuff for 15 years now <laughs> and I also want to talk really nerdy music stuff and really nerdy sound design stuff that people don't really want in a 90 minute documentary you know they kind of mm. I want to make the documentary about hey here's these great composers and sound designers and people that you've never heard of um, here's a kind of introduction to this all 
Um, but then I also want to get really nerdy and have the, those conversations with these people about what did you do, why did you do this, why did you do it this way, you know, when did you do that, what was that for, all these kinds of really um, detailed questions that are too detailed for a documentary film. Um, that was going to be, um, that relates to my next question actually, I was wondering do you have a sort of a, a, a target viewer are you, are you hoping that this is going to be just viewed by people who have no idea about game music or game audio or game sound, or are you intending it to be consumed by gamers or by or who? Who? I mean, yeah. Who's the yeah, who's I, the target there? I think gamers um, are the target market, specifically people who like game music and game sound. Um, but I'm hoping that they're going to watch. Watch that with their friends, with their family, with people who maybe aren't, uh, you know, as into this stuff as they are. Maybe help them to understand why this stuff is so important and, you know, why people like it so much. Mm. Is that the the overall sort of message that you're going to be trying to work into the into the documentary? The 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 fact that this is very significant and is very important. Um, do you have a different kind of message that you're trying to convey with the whole piece? <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm concerned about this kind of um, approach some documentaries take where, you know, I, I keep hearing that Lego song, Everything is Awesome, you know, from yeah. the Lego movie. Everything is awesome. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to do that and make a documentary where it's like, yeah, everything is awesome about game music. Um, but I want to show people that this is, this is an art form. This is something that uh, is very interesting, that there's a lot of complexity to it, that it's worth learning about, and, and maybe next time you play a game, you'll think about it a little bit more. Yeah, I, especially seeing the, the part about tools and techniques. I can't wait to see it and see, like, you know, uh, how, what it's like. You know, there are people out there who don't understand what it takes to get audio in a game, what software you use, are you in a studio like a rock star? Are you in a cubicle like a programmer? You know, they don't know any of that. And this is going to be really cool to show people all the different ways game get, uh, audio gets put into a game. I'd also like to mention that I am backer number 666. Are you? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, who wants to be the neighbor of the beast? <laughs> I bet you were just you were just waiting for that, Carl, when he's like 64, 65. No, no, no. You are exactly right. I'm just watching, just watching. Well, we need to shave the top of your head and look for a little 666 on there now. Now I'll show it to you. It's behind my ear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so uh, well, you know something I wanted to ask you about too is I want to read your book, Pac-Man to Pop Music. That sounds really fascinating. I can presume, and correct me where I'm wrong, please. I should probably just ask you rather than to make the presumption. What is the what is the essence of the book, and and where does it take? Uh, I guess just what's the essence of the book? Well, that book is actually a collection of essays written by a bunch of people. Some of them academic, some of them industry people. So, uh, Damien Kaspauer, um, I believe he was in that book. Gosh, it's been so long since I've opened it up. I'm quite sure he was. He wrote one of those chapters for me. Uh, Anders Carlson, who uh, is from Go to 80, the chiptunes artist. Uh, so a bunch of different people wrote chapters about what they do, um, and we put that together with academics sort of analyzing this stuff and trying to um, uh, sort of fumble our first way into 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 thinking about theorizing this stuff and and writing about it in an academic way. Um, so that book is is a complete sort of collection of, of essays rather than my own personal writing. Oh, still probably very fascinating. And I approve of the cover. Did you guys see the cover? It's got Guitar Hero proud and prominent right in the center. Was that, was that, or that's uh, playing with sound? Oh, they, well, they might have I'm put the confused. Off. It <laughs> says uh, from Pac Man to pop okay. music and then has a, a blue top with an acoustic Okay, guitar. yeah, okay. And then Guitar There's Hero below it. There's another book that I wrote called Playing With Sound, um, and it also you had this Guitar Hero motif, and I had to um, to go back to the publishers and, and say, like, the way that... It was just done in a shadow, and the way that the guy was holding a guitar looked like a guy standing with an erection. I'm like, well, uh. we're going to have to call this, like, Fifty Shades of Game Sound or something and <laughs> market this in a completely new way. You know, this would be awesome. <laughs> so they had to change the cover on that one. Uh, uh, it was a little bit... <laughs> 
That's awesome. So in my notes here also, can you tell me more about vMix? Yeah, so vMix, uh, as if I don't have enough to do, but vMix we're about to launch. Uh, vMix, it's a plugin for Unity iOS that lets a game developer um, tag locations in the game where a player can pick a song for or have a song streamed for them. So the game developer can go in and say, okay, this is battled, this is um, angry, and put those keywords into the code, and then when, it, when somebody is playing the game, music, it, it will go to SoundCloud, it'll find songs that have those keywords and stream it directly into that portion of the game for them, or I'll let, let the player actually pick a song from their own playlist for that spot, and then they can take that playlist, uh, share it over a social network, you know, download other people's playlists, uh, and so on. Wow, that is fascinating. And it's about to, sh about to launch? It is. We we are um, kind of coming out of beta. I just didn't want to launch it while the Kickstarter is going on, but as soon as the Kickstarter is over, we're putting it up in the asset store, and we're, it's free. It's absolutely free for developers, free for the players. Um, it's just something fun that that we built. We we know people are listening to their own music in the game. Yeah. And you know, we just thought there's there's got to be a better way to integrate that into the game rather than just this sort of random songs playing that if you could kind of tie these keywords in the songs with keywords in the game, then it's sort of a, a way to have the same kind of emotional impact of the music that you m maybe not as much as if it was pre-composed for that specific scene, but it's much better than kind of having some random song on your playlist come up at the wrong time. Oh, uh, that's, that's really, really smart. I was fascinated recently by um, Spotify, which is good and bad to some people, but um, I'm part of a new game studio, and our offices are right beside Spotify. We actually share, like, a tech center, and I was talking to them about how they set up their moods, because I thought their moods were pretty interesting. Like, they weren't typical moods in their search, which would say sad or happy or mad or glad. It was... Uh, first kiss on your, you know, the, the kissing your new boyfriend, girlfriend for the first time. What's that feel like? Or, you know, uh, drinking a beer after mowing a lawn. You know, it was that kind of approach to moods. And I thought, that's really fascinating. And so then I started listening to the moods. And I thought, my goodness, you guys are really hitting these out of the park. How did you figure that out? And they were talking about how they take into consideration lyrical content and, uh, and musical motifs and stuff. Is there anything you can tell us similarly about, uh, about vMix and how you're associating the, the words with particular areas of the game so that the proper songs come up? Well, we're letting developers set the mood essentially oh. by saying that you know they they're putting in the keywords I for see. the player. So we're kind of we're keeping that information because when you upload your playlist, we will store the information of who's picking what kinds of songs for what keywords and so on, um, just as a way to kind of develop a, a more intelligent algorithm. So we can do that kind of Spotify-like thing as well. Um, we wanted to integrate Spotify as a streaming service into it. Unfortunately, we don't get Spotify in Canada. So oh. that's kind of been a big hurdle for us is, well, we don't want to tell people you got to sign up for a VPN, go through a VPN, you know, and then log into your game. And, and yeah, so. Um, well, the way you're doing it gives the developer more control too, which is really. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, smart and, way to do it. Well, yeah, it's also more work, although it's not a whole lot of work, and it takes about five minutes to implement it in, into a game. So it's it's not a lot of work, but it, it's another step that you have to think about to do it right. The future might grow out of that, too, though. Can you imagine uh, basing compositions, hiring Mike Shapiro or, or Alex or, or Vince and saying, here are the keywords for this scene, you know, yeah. emotionally attach... Give me some cues that are related to these keywords. You know, this scene has A, B, and C as keyword, but that scene has D, E, and F. Write some specific music that meets those keywords, and it'll just pull it in automatically. That would be... I don't know if that's really any different than the way we're doing it now, except with <laughs> keywords, now that I think about it. <laughs> you, yeah, you get a little bit more of a brief, I think, than keywords, but um, yeah, it's yeah. the same kind of concept. Yeah, I guess kind of automating that a little bit. What was the background behind that concept? Like, how did... What, uh, what was it that uh, that um, set off that? What was the catalyst for that idea that you thought this might be an interesting thing to do? Well, you know, um, I had a master student that did a study looking at what happens to gameplay when players swap out the music with their own music. Um, oh, right. 
And the, the effects were incredible. I mean, everything from you know, changing your, your emotional state while you're playing the game to things like changing the way you play the game. So this was done in, um, in a first-person shooter. Uh, hmm. I'm blanking on the name. I can't believe it. Um, Post-apocalyptic, yeah. There's every first-person shooter ever. Um, anyways, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so we we found things like you know the pacing of the music would change, the pacing of the running or the firing uh, of the player, and and so on. So we just realized you know how much impact the music had, and then we thought, well, if people are listening to their own songs, they're kind of ruining the whole mood of of the game. Um, and they're not playing it the way that the developer intended, which is fine. That's another type of experience. But we wanted to be able to give the developer a bit more control over that experience. So you can still have your own music, but if you do it this way, you're getting a closer experience to what we had designed for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, that is smart. I'll, I'll go ahead, Mike. Oh, I was just going to ask uh, about that study. Was that sort of a formal academic study, or was it uh, yep. from the hip? And it was the two cases were the pre-assigned music versus players using their own music. Um, yep, I can send you a link to. It's actually it's on uh, the Game Studies uh, website. Um, so it's in the Game Studies Journal, which is an academic journal. Um, so Game Studies, and my master student was named Alexander Wharton. Okay, I'm just pasting the link in here. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Here we go. Fallout 3. There we go. Um, gotcha. I'm, I'm curious for the benefit of our, our listeners and viewers as well who might be interested in the results of that study since it seems to tie into the heart of what we do. Were there any cases where you would assign, rather than just allow users to bring their own music, would you assign different types of music to gameplay kind of randomly uh, to see how that would systematically affect the gameplay and what you're talking about? No, we didn't get to that kind of level with this. We just let them pick their own songs. Um, but what was really interesting is that people were really bad at picking the right kind of music for the mood that they wanted to experience. Like, they, they would say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm getting stressed out. I want to calm down. They, they'd pick a piece of music that didn't do that for them. Like, they, they just weren't very skilled in saying, hey, this is good aggressive music or this is good sad music, um, which really surprised me because that's kind of how I've used music my whole life is to you know, alter my mood state or whatever. Um, so that was, for me, one of the most interesting things is that people are really <laughs> crap at choosing songs. It's, uh, you that's know, it's so funny. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, is that specifically because um, they're not sure how the music interacts with the game or is it a I larger so. issue? I, I think it's a little bit of both, um, but it, it, it's definitely the issue of interacting with the gameplay, with the imagery, with the action in the game. It raises a lot of questions for us, doesn't it? Because, I mean, if, if we are making music to make a scene feel energized and make the, the player feel kind of aggressive, if that's our idea of what it is to make somebody feel aggressive, then the actual player themselves is, okay, choose a song from your, from your music collection that will make you feel energized and aggressive. And then they'll go and you know, pick something that's completely different from what we would have done as composers for that project. Um, it raises some questions about you know, the, the, the objectivity of what we're doing when we're choosing moods for music, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Are you getting any, are you, can you gather any information off of what they're choosing once the game is played? Game ship, okay. people are playing it, you see what they're choosing? If they're sharing that, um, so we have a social network built, so if they click, you know, share my playlist with other people, then yeah, that goes into our database, so we can see where they picked what song, uh, which keyword tags were associated with that song. So we will have all of that data. Um, and, and that'll be really interesting to look at, I think, is, is to see uh, why is everybody picking, you know, Miley Cyrus for this level or something, you know, what is that about? Yeah. Um, and then trying to analyze, you know, the, the decision-making process there, too, will be a lot of fun, I think. It'd be great if that was available as some kind of resource to game audio people, like the, um, you know, like the kind of marketing analytical uh, stuff that uh, a lot of them, the companies do for mobile game development. Um, it'd be great if that was as a resource for game audio people. This this scene of this game, this was the most popular tune that was picked. It'll be you know wonderful learning thing, learning tool for us as well. 
I think it would be useful um, for game developers too to see uh, what, it, it, in a way, I mean, because music we sort of kind of coalesce around certain genres and subcultures and so on. So if you suddenly realize that a specific, you know, everybody that likes hip hop is really into your game, then you, you have a new way of marketing that as well to your mm. your customer base because you know the kinds of people that are listening to it. Um, so yeah, I think it could be quite useful. I hear Google will buy it for a billion dollars. <laughs> I will sell it for a billion dollars. <laughs> You're not a negotiator at all. <laughs> uh, 1.5 at least. What's really interesting about uh, that strikes me of what you're saying uh, that immediately just kind of lit up uh, all the possibilities in my imagination is that unlike film music, you know, for years you'd have these um, kind of surveys that give people in test screenings, you know, how did you feel about the music? Did you like the film more or less? And sometimes there'd be cases where music would be thrown out of a film and replaced because these groups would kind of indicate this, this isn't so hot. In gaming, unlike film and everything else, you can really measure certain parameters of the gameplay experience. I mean, obviously there's score, so you can see how well people do in the game, uh, depending on what kind of music. And you could scientifically prove that certain types of music among a certain population gives higher scores. That would be really interesting. And, uh, and more <laughs> I'm subtle sure level. we would see correlations with tempo. Yeah. I mean, you could you could measure kind of the things you were talking about, like aggressiveness of play, certain parameters that aren't as simple as a single number, but you could probably piece together just by tabulating controller movements and all that, and you could try different styles of music or even different composers, and you could prove that Kyle Johnson's music is more exciting than mine just by showing, you know, the different uh, populations' responses to the same game but with different music. So it seems awesome. like a really fascinating um, area. Among two and a half year olds, Mike. <laughs> that was an impossible <laughs> hypothetical. It was just for the sake of argument. Thank you. I just wanted, I just wanted to um, uh, mention a comment that uh, our uh, fantastic regular Matt M mentioned in the chat room here, which is really uh, relevant to your Kickstarter, Karen. He said that even as production tools allow us to push the quality of music and sound design even further, uh, it seems that the rules for game audio were written a long time ago when music was written to chips. And that is why the history is so important. So that's a fantastic uh, point there, Matt. Very true. Yeah, I, th hey. I think the whole concept of interactivity is something that uh, composers have to grapple with constantly in game audio, which they don't have to grapple with in film or, or other forms of media. So I think that aspect of, yeah, that was, I mean, that was there because the chips could do it, and now they're having to do that with orchestras. It becomes a whole other um, difficulty in, in composition that, that makes it really interesting. There isn't really, can we think of any other kind of, um, um, any other paradigm of music where the listener can be so involved in what the music is doing? Is there any other equivalent of what game audio is when it comes to the level that a player can affect the way, or the, the, just the way that the music and what the player is doing are, um, are reacting to each other? Well, uh, you know, just to interject, uh, the game music, and as in game pieces, you know, the likes of you know, John Zorn and you know, Zanakis and you know, some of the more interesting gamey experimental music that's out there, I think provides a very interesting template that actually um, uh, precedes video game music by quite a few years. Um, and actually, some of that stuff has had quite an influence on interactive music of, uh, of music. Hmm. I remember in college we learned about, and you guys, please correct me when I'm wrong, because my memory's a little fuzzy, but we learned about a classical composer who I can't remember, who uh, wrote a bunch of different arrangements and gave like placards with numbers on them to the crowd, and then they would vote and the number that was the most uh, the most voted was the the bridge that they would go into or the chorus. Do you guys remember what I'm talking about? Wow, who is that? that I, wish, I wish I could remember. Sounds kind of John Zorni. Um, well, this it was, sounds kind of John Cagey even too. Yeah, it yeah, does. Was, but you know, you go you can go, go you can go back to Mozart who used to write. You know, he would write. Um, say, a concerto, and break it up into little individual bars, uh, and you would roll a dice to determine which bar should be played next, uh -huh. um, and just resequence the entire song, you know, based must, on your rolling of dice, and that was, must, you know, 300 years ago. 
pretty bored of his of his process by that stage. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just roll the dice. <laughs> At that, you know, I mean, he didn't have a record deal at that point. He had to come up with some sort of something <laughs> to get out there. Yeah, well, there's, I would, I would be fascinating to be, uh, to the. I was just thinking about that that class because I thought it was very fascinating that way back uh, in the classical era that they were that this person had done that. I wish I could remember. Maybe the maybe the chat room can help me. I don't remember who it was. Well, we got to wrap up, guys and gals. Mike, you got another one. Not that. Uh, nothing else I was going to say, but I'd ask Karen um, to appeal to people who might be interested in contributing to your Kickstarter. What would you say are some of the, the top bullet points? What do you think is most interesting about your movie that should make people want to contribute? Oh, wow. <laughs> um... <laughs> You know, I think we just we have we have the right team to do this. Uh, it's the right time to do this, and we need to do this now before more boxes get thrown out. Um, and that this is going to do justice to all of the hard work that's been done over you know the decades of of game music. Uh, we're going to do it right, and we're you know we all have worked in sort of game audio, film audio um, stuff. So it, it, you know we are. The right people to, to give this the respect that it deserves. Yeah, yeah. So what's next, Karen? After uh, after you, the Kickstarter's done and you've got uh, VMix coming out, what's after that? <laughs> well, then we got a film. You know, we've we've got about six months of filming followed by six months of post production. So I figured my next year is pretty much um, not my own. Yeah, I guess I was. I should have worded that differently. Like once you've got the Kickstarter <laughs> project completely done, you've got VMix ah. <laughs> uh, released. What do you think? I about don't know. That? You know, <laughs> I don't know what comes next. That's a, a vacation. Busy for a while. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe a vacation. <laughs> well, it was great having you on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. And, and I, I'm really excited. I hope more people uh, contribute. You guys are getting really close. I can't wait to see who is uh, the neighbor of the beast. I love that term. That's hilarious. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> what, are you, what are you sitting at right now? You're you're practically uh, three fourths of the way there. Wow, so close. Twenty eight days to go. We're Lots getting there. Time. Lots of time for people to contribute. Please do. It's very important. Very important. Karen, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, we stick around just to let you know after the show, and we talk about really cool stuff, and we won't let any of the live people see that. We do it just <laughs> annoying. Uh -huh. So, so I'm going to hit the stop broadcast. Thanks, Chatties, for coming. Thanks for your comments in the in the chat uh, chat room. I'm going to put all the links uh, in the description of the video that will be going up to YouTube once the show ends. And I'll see you guys at the in the green room. Let me hit stop record. Bye. Goodbye.